I'm Kristen Wren, and if not the extraordinaire program chair, I'm the good enough program chair. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, a point of personal privilege before I introduce Dr. Cleaney. I want to say I'm grateful, Bill, for the opportunity and invitation to work alongside you this year. He's been a superb mentor and colleague since I first met him through the AERA Spencer Dissertation Fellowship Program back when we were both younger and had more hair. I also want to thank uh, the program committee from the Division SIGs and AERA committees who are responsible for the vast majority of what happens here at the annual meeting. They and their thousands of volunteers are the ones who get us all here. Felice Devine, Lori Cipriano, and the rest of the AERA staff are unmatchable in their devotion to this organization and to our success as a group. There is no way to thank them properly for their patience with the 2,000 questions I had every week since last April. And last year's program chair, Cynthia Tyson, has been my low-key fairy godmother. There when I've had questions, always there in support and spirit. It's a gift to have a colleague as generous as she. Finally, I thank my dean, Don Heller at Michigan State, and my department chair, Marilyn Amy, as well as all of my department colleagues at Michigan State. Along with my partner, Melissa, and the rest of my family, they have had to live with me and the AERA 2013 meeting for the last 18 months. Thank you for your support, good humor, and confidence. I promise I will not be bringing Bill, Felice, and AERA with me this year to every family celebration. <laughs> right? <laughs> and now to introduce Bill. By the time we elect presidents of our association, they have amassed substantial professional biographies. And in the digital age, it's easy enough to Google William G. Tierney and learn that Bill is university professor and Wilbur Kiefer professor of higher education, director of the Pulleys Center for Higher Education at the University of Southern California. Google Scholar will point you to his considerable body of research on policies and practices related to educational equity, from his early studies of Native American higher education and his writings about queer theory, to his contributions to understanding faculty diversity, for-profit higher education, college access for low-income youth, and understanding organizational cultures in which educational policies are decided and enacted. The quality of his scholarly contributions has been recognized by a Distinguished Research Award from the Association for the Study of Higher Ed and by AERA Division J. He was appointed university professor at USC in 2006 and elected an AERA fellow in 2009. Bill's scholarly work is complemented by a parallel career of service, from the Peace Corps in Morocco to serving as an academic dean at a tribal college. He was the AERA Division J vice president and president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. If there is any duty in academe that involves more controversy than leading a scholarly association, it may be being president of a faculty senate. And Bill has done that as well at the University of Southern California. Outside his formal leadership role, Bill maintains a full docket of advising and mentoring graduate students, fellow faculty, and youth headed for college. Many of us in AERA have benefited from his generosity as a mentor and colleague. The common thread that runs through these intellectual and professional activities is Bill's enduring commitment to systemic improvement in the conditions that perpetuate inequality. Many AERA members, many here, share this commitment. We enact it in diverse ways through scholarship, practice, and activism. What makes Bill's contributions unique are his vision and his drive. He somehow manages to see what's around the corner before many of us are fully aware of what's in front of us now. And his drive propels him forward to examining that new issue and coming to practical recommendations before some people realize there's a problem at all. He has done this throughout his career as a scholar and an educator, and he has done it as a leader for us as well. Colleagues, I am very proud to introduce the president of the American Educational Association, Dr. William Tierney. is 1975. I have graduated from Tufts University and find myself in Tahala, Morocco, a small Berber village in the Atlas Mountains. I arrive in Tahala after two train rides, a third class bus, and a final hike into town. I am lonely. My Arabic is horrible. I can only speak in the present tense. I am leaving my bags in Fez yesterday. I go to Fez tomorrow. I return in two nights, but I teach today, I tell my high school principal when I meet him. I am an object of intense curiosity. I am the town's first foreigner, and in addition to not speaking Arabic, I don't speak French. 
One lonely evening, there is a knock on my door. When I open it, I meet Nejmi. He is wearing a slightly tattered brown jalaba that is soiled around the edges, and he has on old black shoes with holes in the top. He is a small, rotund man. He grabs my hands as he offers the standard greeting, Salamu alaikum, the peace of Allah be with you. I know enough to say in return, alaikum salam, and the peace of Allah be with you. He keeps holding my hands and laughs slightly as he tells me he has heard that I want an Arabic teacher. I will teach you, he says. We will be friends. Let's take a walk. Nejmi teaches me Arabic by taking me for walks in the foothills of the, of the Atlas Mountains above town. As is standard in Morocco, he often holds ha my hand as we walk, and my awkwardness and the villagers' initial curiosity gives way as everyone sees Nejmi teaching his American. Although Nejmi is only a few years older than me, I treat him like a respected elder. We do not have a good equivalent in English for what Nejmi is. His life centers around studying the Quran, although he is neither a minister nor monk. When we walk, children come up to him and kiss his hand. We are very different, William, he begins that first day. Do you like us? How are we different? That question and my response begins a conversation that continues for many months. He speaks quietly and corrects my numerous grammatical mistakes. He keeps asking what I like and don't like and how Morocco is different from America. About a year passes and we are sitting quietly against a tree watching the sunset. Allah has given us many blessings, William, this day, our friendship. Praise Allah, I say. I am now able to speak in the present, the past, and the future tense. Nejmi is leaving in a month for a Quranic school in the south. I am sad you are leaving, my teacher, I say, and he laughs at my formality. When you go home, William, he says, try to remember the teachings of Allah. You are a Christian, but remember Allah's truths. Evil occurs when we forget. Always try to learn. The suffering of the world is from those who neither remember nor learn. And then it's 1978. After returning home and picking up a master's at Harvard, I am working on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation at a tribally controlled community college. The tribal college movement started because if a hundred children enter high school on a reservation, only three will get a college degree. The assumption is that if sending native students away to primarily white institutions produces these abysmal results, then surely tribal colleges can do a better job. I am the academic dean at the tribal college, although the title of dean is snazzy for someone who is 23. Our college is a series of trailers. For the first time in my life, I am getting what I think of as a big salary, almost $20,000. I buy a car. I buy a leather coat, cheap leather. But nonetheless, I look good. <laughs> I am driving to a friend's house for supper in the early spring. In North Dakota, it is still cold, freezing. I have become friends with one of the families. They live in Mandaree in a log cabin a few miles off the main road. The house is beautiful and the barn even bigger. I arrive and my friend comes out to meet me. She says her father needs to talk to me. Paige is one of the tribal elders and he commands a great deal of respect. Because of diabetes, he has lost one and now both legs. I sit with him and have a cup of coffee as often as I can. I have never seen him angry, and he always tells his stories in a low rumble that makes me lean forward. Early on, during one of the first times I meet him, he sees me looking at my watch and says quietly, 
you white people, you are always in such a hurry. Take your time, slow down, listen. He does not say this in an angry or loud way, but I am ashamed. I go in to speak with Paige and remove my gloves to shake hands. It is still cold and my leather coat is zipped all the way up. Bill, I need your help, he says. I'm very excited that someone like Paige would ask me for help. Perhaps he needs me to write something for him or maybe go to tribal court. I have a calf in breach, he says. I look at him with no understanding. <laughs> he tells me it's calving season and one of his calves is in breach. He explains to me what this is and he shakes his head. I can't pull, I can't pull her out. I need you to help. I nod, still not really understanding. <laughs> I grew up in the suburbs. We go into the barn and there is a cow on her side in labor. There are chains connected to the legs of the calf and he says to me, now you need to be gentle and strong. Pull that calf out. For the next few minutes, I dig my heels into the ground. I am pulling, pulling, pulling. The calf comes out with a pop, and as it does, I fall on my back onto the hay. My leather jacket is splattered from top to bottom. Paige wheels himself over to me and gives me his hand to pull me up. Good job, son, he says. Welcome to the res. By 1984, I am done with Stanford and have another master's degree and PhD in hand. I have suffered through courses in decision analysis, a bunch of classes in economics and statistics, but most of my time is in anthropology, studying with Shirley Heath, Renato Rosaldo, Joseph Greenberg, George Spindler. David Tyack, a historian, and Shirley Heath are on my dissertation committee. I have found graduate life exciting but daunting. I keep reading, I don't know anything. At one point I say to David that I'll never be able to write anything. David smokes a pipe in his office at that time and he sits back and, and nods. I'm older than you, but if you choose this life, it means a lot of evenings reading and writing. You have to love it. When I finish my master's, on Jean-Jacques Rousseau and this unknown Frenchman in 1983, Pierre Bourdieu, I wait outside Shirley's office to give me the good word. Actually, I don't really need the good word because I wrote it. This thesis is superb. <laughs> Shirley comes down the hall, opens the door, and before I sit down, starts in. You're not convincing. Look at the introduction and it never ties back at the end. What's your argument? You're just stating things. There's no analysis. Her voice becomes a blur as I gaze out the window trying to not burst into tears. A quiet fills the room. She takes my wrist, looks at me, and says quietly, argue with me. You always argue. Come on. I suppose if you want to know where things began, this is what I'd say. If you're doing a life history of my intellectual trajectory, it's these sorts of moments where it would start. It was a long time ago, but when I think back, those are the sorts of things that made an impact on me. Those are the sorts of things I remember. Now, you've asked about my year as president. We accomplished a lot. We joined a group, Scholars at Risk, to emphasize our concern about human rights and the protection of academic freedom. We adopted a resolution on human rights. Three task forces published reports that ultimately had useful impacts. We changed the journal and started another for the first time in a generation. We reauthorized spending monies on research conferences that reflected the diversity of the organization. 
After the tragedy of Sandy Hook, we offered commentary about how to reduce gun violence in schools. We filed an amicus brief on behalf of affirmative action. Now, I learned a lot during that year. I could not have accomplished as much as I had without the support of the council and Felice Levine, the association's executive director. But I've always maintained that if patience is a virtue, it's not been one of mine. I wanted the association to do more, and that's where the theme of the Conference on Education and Poverty and my talk came in. It was so long ago, it seems like yesterday. What should our stance be as an association in dealing with poverty? What should my stance have been? What's the role of the academic? Here's what I thought then, but I didn't say in my presidential address. Until the early 21st century, education was viewed as a public good. Being America, we argued about this forever, but we called for more education for our children and citizens since the time of Horace Mann. The assumption was that individuals and the country benefited by an educated populace, not simply in training, but in democratic engagement. First elementary and middle school, and then high school became standard. By the mid 20th century, college had become of increasing importance. The belief was that a way out of poverty and into the middle class was via education. In A Raisin in the Sun, Lorraine Hansberry's searing portrait of racism in the 1950s. At the end of Act One, Walter, the husband and father of the poor black family, thinks he has come into some money that will make him wealthy and let them move into a house. In a long soliloquy to his seven-year-old son in the family living room where the boy sleeps, Walter dreams of better days, and he says to the boy, and I'll pull the car up on the driveway, just a plain black Chrysler, I think with white walls, no black tires, more elegant. Rich people don't have to be flashy. I'll have to get something sportier for your mom, though, maybe a Cadillac convertible to do her shopping in. And I'll go inside the house and your mom will come downstairs and meet me at the door and we'll kiss each other and we'll go up to your room to see you sitting on the floor with the catalogs of all the great universities in America, all the great universities in the world. And I'll say, all right, son, it's your 17th birthday. What is it you've decided? Just tell me where you want to go and you'll go. Yes, sirree, son, tell me what you want to be and you'll be it. Walter's comments made me think of a life history I had done of Robert Sunchild, a pseudonym, a Native American academic who died of AIDS in 1992. Here's what, part, here's what Robert said. In the eighth grade, I won a spelling bee for the school, and my parents didn't want to go to the city championships. We know now that it's important for a kid, but my mom didn't know any better. I don't blame her at all. As I progressed in school, and people said I was a good student, I remember my mom saying, if I have to scrub floors on my hands and knees for you to go to college, I will. She really tried. And that made me think of a series of cultural portraits we did in the Puglia Center in 2004. One that I did was of a high school student I worked with who ended up going to Stanford. He graduated with a master's degree in engineering he was a poor student born in Ethiopia and moved to the United States when he entered high school. As immigrants, his parents knew 
about the importance of education. I visited his family one day, and after a phenomenal meal, the father said to me, everything is so rushed here. In our country, we are always visiting. There's time. You'll have coffee now. In our country, we have three cups. Over the next hour, we sipped coffee. They spoke about Ethiopia and about their hope for their son to go to college. At one point, the daughter said, everything is so expensive here. He has to get a loan. The son responded, no, I need a grant, a fellowship. We have a low income. I must be sure to get a grant. We can't pay. Eventually, I took my leave. As I walked to the door, the father shook my hand. Please help my son. He is a good boy. He must go to college. The problem by the turn of the 21st century was that America considered itself exceptional, and we were. Tocqueville invoked the idea of exceptionalism in his 19th century travels, and the idea stayed with us. But in the early years of the 21st century, we were exceptional in the wrong way. Rather than having more economic mobility, our country had less. True, white middle class mobility was similar across countries, but the United States has more low income persistence and less upward mobility. Based on analyses that utilized the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, intergenerational mobility was among the lowest for the United States of all industrialized countries. Moving out of the poorest sector of society became even harder. If you were born poor in the early 21st century, a decade later, over 40% remained poor. We also needed to understand the impact of concentrated poverty. The proportion of high poverty schools had grown roughly 10% in the first decade of the 21st century. We knew that socioeconomic integration mattered. Some even argued that it trumped extra resources in boosting achievement. We also knew that effective policies existed to deconcentrate poverty and desegregate schools. The recession during the first decade of the 21st century made things even worse. The Census Bureau reported that 46 million Americans, nearly one in six, were living below the poverty line. In absolute numbers, that was the greatest number of Americans living below the poverty line since they started keeping records in 1959. Children were particularly impacted. Six and a half million children under the age of 18 lived with an unemployed parent in 2010. One in five children lived in poverty. In the District of Columbia, Mississippi, and New Mexico, the number approached one in three. Inequality in the United States has risen to a level not seen since the 1920s. In the 1960s, the income of the richest people was 30% of the poorest. By the 2000s, the ratio had increased to 80%. Back then, if we wanted to lessen inequality, what were the levers that we ought to have pulled? Closer to home, if inequality was a concern, then what should I have done? What is the role, the responsibility of the intellectual to help eliminate poverty? That was the question that motivated me when I constructed my talk. We needed to come forward with the best research that existed to solve these problems, but there is also something to be said to hear, to listen, to respect the life stories and challenges that young people faced as they tried to use education as a route of pov out, out of poverty. But I didn't talk about that in my address. I'll tell you why in a minute. But let me tell you first of a student I knew. Some years ago, I mentored a high school student who participated in the mentoring program that I started. He was extremely respectful. He was an altar boy. He went to daily mass. He was an honor student. And he was undocumented. His family was in the process of getting their green cards. 
In 2004, in California, everything seemed set. He was accepted to UC Santa Cruz, and we celebrated. He was the first in his family to go to college. Then he showed up to my office one day in June. He was upset. What's up? He handed me a letter from the university denying him financial aid because he wasn't documented, even though he was in the process of getting his green card. I looked at him, and he uncharacteristically exploded. You told me if I worked hard, if I studied hard, if I worked even harder, that I could go to college. This isn't fair. He gasped for breath and he repeated, this isn't fair. Silence filled the room that afternoon. He looked at me and said more as an accusation than a question, what are you going to do? I spent the better part of a month making phone calls to various agencies and individuals and finally, quietly, we were able to get him the financial aid necessary to attend Santa Cruz. Periodically during college, he checked in with me either to ask a question or just to see how, he, how I'm doing. One day he emailed me and told me the good news. He graduated with a 3.0 in psychology. He spent two years working with the poor in Los Angeles. He considered the priesthood, but laughingly told me one day, I like girls too much. <laughs> he eventually applied for a PhD in psychology and became a community psychologist. There was no small irony that someone who was undocumented, who others spoke of by using the epithet illegal, spoke to me in terms of fairness. America is supposed to be a society that is fair. In his young life, he had internalized the notion of fairness. He had played by America's rules and understood what's fair and what's not. And he raised a question that followed me since Morocco. But Jose's question put it front and center. What would I do? The university has been viewed as a fortress removed from society in order to study society. The metaphor of a cloister of men, mostly men, removed from the rough and tumble of society is one that pervaded academe from the time of the notion of the ivory tower back in the 15th century. In the 19th century, the United States was an academic backwater. Our institutions were largely inward looking, either training students for religious life or the rich for a life of leadership circumscribed by the social skills learned in college. Even with the explosion of higher education in the later decades of the 19th century with the land grant acts and the beginning stutter steps toward the creation of research universities, the assumption was that the academic needed to be disengaged. True, we had public intellectuals, but the reward system throughout the 20th century remained wedded to the notion of blind peer review. Work being judged worthy of publication went into outlets largely read by other academics. When I was young, I was cautioned not to be involved with one or another movement, to focus on my research, to keep my head low, advice I did not heed. In AERA in 2013, there was a constant tension about the sort of work we should do. There seemed a sense that some sort of research mattered, and if it mattered, then those who did another kind of research didn't matter. People tended to talk only amongst themselves. I wanted to bridge that divide, but I failed. The best work in 2013 said that we needed more people moving from high school to college. If we ever wanted the economy to restart again, we needed more people 
in some form of post-secondary education, even if it was a certificate. If we wanted to help end poverty, then the schools needed to be better. More of our students needed to be, be prepared for high wage jobs and greater civic engagement. For my own work, that meant we needed more people attending college. So here's what I said in my talk. We know we are losing ground with regard to participation in higher education when we look at comparable countries. We know that a bachelor's degree is likely to earn an individual a significant amount of more money than if he or she only has a high school degree. We know that not everyone needs a bachelor's degree, but a high school degree is no longer sufficient for the vast majority of our students. And we know from Russ Rumberger's thoughtful work on dropouts that those who will fill jobs that only need a high school degree will need better preventive measures that keep them from dropping out. There's a need for better workforce preparation. We also know that too many students go to college and they are not college ready. Look at my own state of California. In the CSU system, close to 60% need some sort of remedial course and 26% at the University of California. And this is after having taken a college ready curriculum. What do we do? What do we do to increase the numbers of students going to college? What do we do to ensure they are college ready? Based on my work, as well as a collaborative effort for the What Works Clearinghouse, there are five points we can make with a modicum of confidence based on the evidence. The way I think about this is with finite time and finite money, resources a school cannot do everything. What might we recommend to increase access to college and to create a college-going culture. So let me offer five recommendations. The simple point here is students and their families need to know sooner rather than later what courses they need to take. And those courses need to be available. In California, I can tell you by the 10th grade if a student is on track to meet the requirements to get into the University of California. There's no magic here. It simply calls for a clear set of academic courses and the ability to inform students about what they need to do. I have always found that students will rise to what we expect of them. We have to have expectations. Two, some people are very big on assessment. Me, not so much. No child left untested is part of my problem. Simply testing someone doesn't do much. If I'm ill and go to the doctor and she says I need an MRI, fair enough. But if a year later I go to the doctor and she looks at me, concludes I have cancer, and pulls out the chart and says, yep, you sure do, look right here, I reckon I'd be pretty angry. Or if she sent me a message a few months after the test with a bunch of numbers that I didn't understand, but I felt fine, I don't know if I'd do anything. But that's basically what we do far too often with high school students when it comes to college readiness. Now I know there is some research that points out that we need to know how students are doing. But students need to know how they're doing. We would say that a doctor who took a test, found out I was ill, and didn't prescribe a path to wellness, committed malpractice. What about kids who are tested and we do nothing, or do not inform them or their parents in culturally appropriate ways? That's the second half of that recommendation. Assessment by itself won't do much, and we need a plan that we can adhere to, the students can adhere to, in order to overcome any problems. Third point, recommendations matter. I often will ask high school students who they talk to about college and they'll say no one. There's a fellow I know who got into and graduated from UC Santa Barbara. When he got accepted, he emailed me telling me he got in and said, thought you'd like to know. He didn't tell his mom right away. 
He didn't have any friends who were going to college. In fact, it was not too cool. He attended a high school that didn't celebrate going to college. So we need to think about how to have students aligned with peers and adults who talk about college. The fourth point is that applying to college is confusing, especially if you're going to an elite university. Students don't know how to write the college essay. They don't know what people are looking for. I want to be all I can be is not the sort of verbiage that works. I come from a middle class family. I wrote my college essay for Tufts University with my mother watching guard. And I can remember my mother, ever the English teacher, reading it over, correcting the spelling and punctuation. I spoke with a student a few years ago and asked her if she knew where she wanted to go. She said she had narrowed it down. Santa Monica Community College, Cal State LA, and Berkeley. I asked her why. She said her friend went to Santa Monica, her brother went to Cal State, and her teacher said Berkeley was good. She looked at all three websites, they all had women's soccer, so that's what she decided. She didn't understand the difference between a community college and a university. The point is not simply delineating the differences across institutions, but to enable students to apply to those institutions where they are best suited. Too often, highly talented, low-income students never apply to top colleges. My job, our job, is to raise aspirations rather than level or destroy them. And finally, we need to help students and their families understand how college costs. When I went to college, my parents were the bank. I never asked if we could afford to go to college. My question was where to go. But for students I work with, the cost of college is confusing. If you've never used a bank or taken out a loan, then all of this is intimidating. And college can seem ephemeral. Should I work with my dad tomorrow, watering lawns and getting $8 an hour, or delay for four years and get a college degree that I'm not sure will land me a job? I think of these issues as fitting within two primary frames. One frame pertains to the cognitive capacity students have so that they're ready for college. When 60% of the students heading to Cal State LA have to take a remedial class, you don't need to be Albert Einstein to say that we need to do something to improve students' academic preparation. The other frame pertains to what I think of as college knowledge. Students do not know about college life. As a high school sophomore, my parents and I met with my guidance counselor. We started talking about colleges I might want to apply to and what courses I needed to take. My older brothers went to college. That's extremely different from the students I work with today, many of whom don't even have a college counselor. In a high school where the dropout rate is north of 40% and the college going rate is south of 30%, there's not a great deal of college knowledge going on amongst the students. Instrumental issues such as what tests to take and when, or deadlines for applications and scholarships are often missed. Larger issues such as time management, note-taking, financial literacy, complicate the college-going readiness completion undertaking. Some of us arrive to academes' doorsteps ready and assume that there are those who will help me if I have a question. Others of us arrive not ready. We are either unaware that there are individuals and offices who might help, or we assume that we should not ask for help. If we are going to fight poverty, then we need the best research that exists that we might build on to improve educational outcomes at all levels. But to say that suggests that we do nothing or say nothing until we are certain. And certainty is not a quality that I'm very comfortable with in the 21st century. Take my work on games and social media. We know that student to counselor ratios should be about 250 to 1. Nationally, it's about 400 to 1. In California, it is 800 to 1. 
Things are not going to change, and it seems idiotic to ask overworked teachers to take on the confusing task of counseling kids about career and college choices. Part of my work over the last several years has focused on working with the Game Innovation Lab in the School of Cinema at USC. We have been building games for high school students. Games have been around a long time. Parcheesi is perhaps the world's first game, created in India around 500 AD. Royalty played using members of the parents as pieces on large outdoor boards. Parcheesi evolved first into cloth, then wood. Parcheesi has been a game of chance, strategy, and rules. Archeezy was social. Teams played and some won. People played the game multiple times. It's also fun. The United States was a late adopter. We had our own games. Baseball gets its first reference in 1791. Baseball as a game evolved. It became popular in the 19th century. Like Parcheesi, it is a game of chance and strategy. Lord knows it has rules. It is social. Teams play against one another. It is also fun. It's time for Dodger baseball. Unless you are a Dodgers fan. <laughs> How does a game fit with what I do? We are inventing a series of games about college. The first is mission admission. We are trying to instill in students the idea of college knowledge. We're trying to invent a series of games that is fun, strategic, and social. The theory of action is one of the group rather than the lone individual. We work with students to build games. Student game designers know more about what we do, about what's cool and what's not. They tell us what's working and what's boring. We sent mission admission out for review so we could improve it. A thousand people got the game. Based on their feedback, we revised it again. Now it's on Facebook. To build games, I've had to work out of the box across disciplines. Here's my friend, Tracy Fullerton, in the School of Cinema. As a game designer uh, for nearly 20 years now, I have seen the real power of games. And now I've actually come into academia and working across the boundaries um, with new partners and new models to really understand how we can unleash the power of games uh, to address some of the biggest challenges that our society faces together. We've been doing the research to see if this works. The research on games and social media as tools for learning is far from definitive. Our friends at Crest and EDC are involved in analyzing games, as is my center. A grant from IES enables us to evaluate the effectiveness of games on college going. Does playing the game lead to greater understanding of the admissions process? Now, in the second game, Future Game, is a game for middle school students. Same format, design, and assumption. have a financial literacy game in the works. We're just mapping it out. Recent studies suggest that text messages might increase enrollment of low-income students. Over 75% of all teenagers text, and they send over 50 texts a day. Imagine that. To impact poverty, we have to think in new ways. We know what doesn't work. We know that when adults build websites for kids, that kids find them a snooze. Check out the college-going websites. Then check out the websites that teenagers are drawn to. Simply stated, to change the world, we've got to take risks. So that's pretty much what I said in my talk. But I should have said more. 
I should have gone on and pointed out that as we move toward understanding, we also must listen. And once we know, we must act. And we must get out of the rarefied halls of the academy, engage in dialogues, dialogues of respect. If we know that those points I mentioned matter based on the best research out there, such knowledge only takes us so far. My experience over the last 20 years has less to do with my pontificating and more with listening. And at times, that has to do with bearing witness to the struggles and challenges that young people face in their daily lives. And from this listening comes a sense not of how I see the world, but how the students that I've hung out with see the world, how they view the world, how they think the world is changing. In Michael Cole's thought-provoking distinguished lecture in 2010 for AERA, he spoke of the importance of leveraging the cultural resources of the family in order to change the cultures of the classroom. At times, it seems that our solutions try to strip culture away as if it is either absent or irrelevant or detrimental. I try to make sense of students' lives, but to do so, I need to spend time and to listen in a manner that Mike Rose does in his writing about working adults. One of my mentees once said when I suggested that we might do a life history, I've had a different sort of life. I went to school and everything, but I was alone at school, especially middle school. If what you want is a typical kid, that wasn't me. The Ethiopian student whose home I visited and drank coffee with his father once spoke to me about his first name. Some teachers had a problem saying it, and they suggested he change it to a more American name, one that was easier to pronounce. I asked him what he thought when people suggested he should change his name. He shook his head, no way. My parents gave me my name. It means something special in Amharic. I'm not changing it. Another student said to me, sometimes people just don't want to listen. I mean, why listen to me? I'm just a teenager. I have found such comments commonplace in my work with urban youth. If I want to develop a game that these sorts of youth will use, then I need to listen to the consumer. All too often, speaking about one's life, the sorrows, the joys, and fears, are narratives that either do not interest people or are impossible to have in a manner that is other than brief or facile or happens within the confines of a therapist's office. I think about these things all the time, a student said to me one day, but I just don't talk about them. I appreciate, for those of us whose obsession is impacting policy or advancing theory, that an N of one or three or five or 60 can be problematic. But these young people pointed out what I actually find with every child I meet. Everyone has a different sort of life. My role is not to smush these lives together as if we are all homogenous or should be, but to think about the exceptionalities and from these unique identities, I might be able to say something based on evidence to a teacher or legislator or parents or the individual. And when we document the lives of the students I work with, there is also a moral urgency that may resonate in a manner that is not always possible elsewhere. Now, after I stepped down as president of AERA, life resumed. AERA, with its 25,000 members in 2013, changed incrementally over the years. The profits 
of doom and gloom were proven wrong by 2025, the association grew to 35,000 members. The annual conference still took place in a specific location, although there were meetups in several regional cities. More people now attended remotely throughout the globe than at the conference. Although it took a great deal of angst, and again, a great many Jeremiah's predicting the apocalypse, all of the journals went online. <laughs> the result was greater access to AERA's work and greater breadth of the sorts of work we did. What about me, you ask? In 2025, did the hopes I had come true for the association? Back in 2025, I would have said that it depends if the glass is half empty or half full. The theme of the conference in 2013, like I said, was education and poverty, and some good came of it. A bunch of papers were published. Good arguments ensued about what to do. Some of our work made its way into the public arena. The task forces made an impact. Faculty began to talk about ways to move tenure policies in a manner that supported greater engagement with communities. The rapid rise of adjunct faculty made that task force critical. The association eventually moved aggressively to seek out new members. A preoccupation with school violence and bullying placed the association's work front and center. But the needle on poverty barely budged. A dozen years after the conference, and the educational landscape did not look that differently, from what it did during my presidential term. Dropouts in 2025 were still too high and college going too low. The poor and students of color were still underrepresented. Urban schools, although moderate progress had been made here and there, were still the lonely places that I mentioned in one of my presidential notes. What about me personally in 2025? Well, not that much changed. I still wrote and taught. I still played the field when it came to methodology. Being a professor was part of me. It was what I did. I was still good at it. So in 2025, I saw, saw no reason to stop. Now somewhere out there, one of my associate deans has just whispered to the other, we're stuck with him until 2025? <laughs> An assistant professor has said, is he never going to retire? <laughs> One of my graduate students has whispered, I don't care how long he stays as long as I get through laurels. <laughs> and Barry has just mouthed the words, well, it's fine if you want to keep working, but I'm sure not. <laughs> so we arrive at today. Yes, I retired a while ago. I've surprised myself that I'm doing what I said I would never do. I still read education research. I even keep up with AERA. It makes me laugh to think one of my students' student is now president. Boy, am I old. But it is 2050. AERA still plugs along. The insularity is less the quality of research seems more engaged. You want to know if I have any regrets. Would I have done anything differently during that year? Sure. Who wouldn't do things differently? It's always possible to change something in one way or another to improve on it. The talk. Could I have improved the talk? I've thought about that from time to time. Retirement lets you think about the past. I have a regret, if you want to know the truth. As I mentioned, I became president during a particular moment in the association's trajectory. We emphasized research, but we defined it in a particular manner. Our focus tended to be toward one another rather than those outside of the academy. All too often, we only wanted to listen to those with whom we agreed, and we dismissed everyone else. 
sure the elegance of one's research design and methods is essential. But I look back. I think of those students who said no one was listening to them, that they felt alone. I think of Shirley telling me that I should argue with her and how I learned to argue and respect different points of view. I think of being on the reservation and Paige quietly criticizing me for being in a hurry that I didn't listen. I think of Nejmi in Morocco in 1975 asking me how we were different and what it meant. All of these things go into, went into, who I was as president, as professor, as Bill. I don't think you can cordon things off in a bottled up way. I wish I'd said that. What I should have done is not given a button down talk. I should have looked back over my work and life and spoken not only from the head, but from the heart. Now that I think about it, what I should have done was begin the talk by saying, the year is 1975. Thank you. <laughs>